Hey guys, welcome back to another video. If you're new to the channel, hi, my name is Jeevan. I'm a fourth year medical student studying in Poland. And if you'd like to know which Polish medical university I go to, as always, make sure to go and check out this video here. So, let's get straight into the video. So in today's video, we're going to be doing another reaction video. Now, you guys absolutely love the whole reacting to these different Polish videos. You really, really did because Let's take a small moment to appreciate these numbers. This one here with around 2,000 views with around 100 likes. This one that had 9.2 thousand views and had 396 likes. And then had this one which had around 12,000 views with uh, around 400 likes. Got this video here which got around 43,000 views and 1.6 thousand likes. All together, it's around 65 to 70,000 views gained just from these videos, which is just insane. And it just goes to show you guys really, really like these. So you guys are in for a treat because now I have quite a long list of videos that I'm going to be reacting to in the future. So in today's video, I've got my laptop. We're going to be reacting to the animated history of Poland part one. Without further ado, let's get straight into the video. This video has been made possible by The Great Courses Plus. Use the link below or head to the Great Courses Plus slash mini for your free one month trial and to show your support for the channel. Stick around to find out more. If you live in Central or Eastern Europe, you probably grew up hearing the folktale of the three brothers, Lech, Czech and Rus. The three legendary patriarchs of the Slavic peoples. While out on a hunting trip, the brothers had a disagreement, as brothers do, on which prey to follow, leading them to split up. Czech, the eldest of the brothers, followed his prey to the Czech clans. Rus, the youngest, went east and became the founder of Russia, and Lech, in the middle, founded Poland. Because who cares about consistency? Lech. The tale differs slightly from place to place, but many include that Lech traveled yes. north as he followed a beautiful white eagle. I've heard of the eagle landed in its nest at sunset and looked very breathtaking against the red sky. Yeah. Lech took this for And hence, that's where the Polish flag, or the Polish emblem, which is, you know, the eagle with the red background, I think this, this is one of the background stories for, I think so, I, I believe reading about this, but yeah. And decided that the land would be his new home. The white eagle is still a symbol of Poland, blazoned against the red sky of their flag. Okay, cool. Oh, I think it's the introduction for the thing. I've seen some of these videos, but for different uh, histories, that is. It's really, really cool. They cover so many things, it's really awesome. Super. Indeed, okay, here we go. did begin with Slavic settlements. The Slavs are likely a civilization that emerged as remnants of the early Indo European peoples who had migrated out of the Caucasus. From their homeland in Central Europe, they began to expand and migrate in response to the weakening of the Roman Empire. You will remember this from previous episodes as the Great Migration Period. The Poles loved their new home, which they shared with Germanic tribes from Scandinavia and the occasional Asian nomadic raiders. The Slavs of Poland were organized into smaller tribes, living in and around the Baltic Sea and the Vistula River Delta. They united under Poland's first official leader, Mieszko. Mieszko was a Duke of the Polands. This was a good gig to have since the tribe eventually became the name of the whole country, Poland. Mieszko was a member of the noble house of Piast, whose dynasty would rule Poland for centuries. With his baptism in 966, the country slowly abandoned traditional Slavic paganism and adopted Western Christianity. Mieszko's son, Bolesław the Brave, expanded the territory south into what he hoped would be a strong regional power, but alas, it was a bit too early for that still. He established the Metropolitan See at Gniezno, forming the headquarters of what would become the Catholic Church in Poland. Mm. His consolidation of power led him to be crowned Poland's first official king, and then he died in, in the same year, which is great. Pia's dynasty was somewhat up and down, and internal conflicts often plagued the royal court. Until this guy, Kazimierz the Restorer, restored the monarchy's control, which, come to think of it, is probably why they called him the Restorer. He modernized Poland into a feudalist society, which came with all its cool things like knights and lords and castles. This helped secure the borders, who up until now had changed depending on who was king. The early kingdom. Oh. Adds. Ads, ads, ads. Eve Online is a vast universe. Uh, skip ad. Alive. Sorry, guys. Somewhat weaker than its neighbors, and strapped for cash, did, however, halt the Mongol invasion into Europe, having been sacked twice before. Mm. Notable of this time was the Polish relationship with the Germans, whose dukes and lords had come to possess large amounts of the West. 
and the Teutonic Knights, who had carved out a significant state for themselves in Livonia and Prussia, a land Russia. inhabited by pagans, frequently raided by crusaders. By the time Pierre's rule ended with Casimir the Great, Poland had lost much of its territory to its neighbours, but with a period of peace, the state soon began to prosper and attract Jewish settlement. Mm -hmm. The counties in so this area became a source of contention between the kings of Poland and the Holy Roman Empire, who fought over the local lords for fealty and allegiance. This okay. resulted in these counties being very mixed with populations of people from both kingdoms. The whole thing was very unbohemian, really. <laughs> The Jews first settled Poland as merchants on popular trade routes. By this century, the Jewish people had settled in great numbers over many kingdoms in Europe and began their long and very sad history. Yeah. They were expelled victims of massacres and worse, crusades. Successive expulsions led the population in Poland to swell, which was a comparatively more tolerant society, which became a center of Judaic learning and culture as the centuries yeah. continued. However, things weren't always super peachy, and anti-Jewish riots often erupted in Polish town. Yeah, I believe uh, Krakow and Poznan, actually, they had uh, some of the biggest Jewish uh, settlements, or, uh, yeah, some of the biggest Jewish sort of populations, I'd say. The synagogues were frequently burned. King Kazimierz the Great, dying without an heir, left his kingdom to his nephew Louis, the King of Hungary. Louis mm. left his now three kingdoms to his daughters, one of whom died unexpectedly, the other, who was supposed to inherit Poland but inherited Hungary instead, mm. and the last one, Jadwiga, who got Poland. The nobles of... Could you imagine just getting a country? Like, you know, when you inherit something, it's maybe a house or some watch or something, you know, but I got a country. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. And welcomed Louis's daughter and crowned her king. Yes, king, not queen. Don't ask. What? Jedwiga's life would not be unlike a medieval television drama as she was simultaneously engaged to both the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Igela, whose kingdom was huge and powerful, and the Habsburg Duke of Austria, who was inbred and fat. <laughs> I think she made the right okay. choice. The union of Jedwiga and Vladislav formed the Polish Lithuanian Union, which was now the largest country in Europe under a single monarchy. Wow. The Lithuanians had become a strong military power in the previous century, capturing large amounts of Russian and Mongol land. Nice. The combined countries spread from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The Lithuanians, with their far smaller population, never ventured too far from their castles, why would you, and preferred to rule Ruthenia from Livonia instead. So by the time of the Union, the much larger Polish population came to dominate the Ruthenian lands spreading the language and the culture, eventually dwarfing their Livonian allies. The Teutonic Order, that German state on the Baltic, had become somewhat of a bad neighbour, leading raids, crusades, and plundering castles, or otherwise stumbling drunk into Polish-Lithuanian territory, starting fires and whatnot. The union of the two states proved beneficial, handing the knights a crushing defeat at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. They also fought numerous wars with the Muscovites, Tatars, and Ottomans, Noteworthy of the Igalian period was the efficiency of the feudal system and the pseudo-democratic nature of the parliament, who set up a sophisticated bureaucracy for king approval, or disapproval, if you are unlucky. Within just a few decades, the Teutonic Order had completely lost their state, with the western half being at... I'm not going to lie, but generally, uh, very, very early Polish history is something that I'm not particularly aware of as much, except from a few things here and there, compared to my World War knowledge of Poland. That... I think that's probably my best bit, but uh, this is all very new for me and it's super interesting. It's just amazing how countries just shape over years, over years in a century. Amazing, it's amazing. Quickly into Poland and the rest becoming a faith of the Polish crown. This gave access of Poland to the prosperous Baltic seaports and an explosion in trade. Keep your eye on this, it becomes important later. The Prussian faith would later be inherited by a duke from Brandenburg, a state within the... Sorry guys for the ad. Unfortunately, I'm not able to. Today, at skip least, it. we're going to talk about the latest part. There we go. In the Holy Roman Empire, a trend which would become ever more troublesome as lords within the HRE would increasingly inherit lands outside the imperial borders. The HRE was weird, don't worry about it. Acquiring Danzig or Gdańsk had huge economic benefits, and cities swelled in size in response to the trade boom, like Poznan, Lwów, and the capital Kraków, and most notably Warsaw. Warsaw, or Warszawa in Polish, was up to this point just a small fishing village. Legend has it that a fisherman named Warsh happened upon a mermaid in the Vistula River named Shava. The two married and found the town of Warszawa. 
The Poles, like wow. most Europeans, were often embroiled in wars, and this made famous their heavy cavalry, the Winged Hussars, which I'm sure I'll be mobbed and lynched if I don't talk about. Initially a contingent of Hungarian mercenaries, the Hussars soon became an elite shock cavalry so powerful they allowed the Poles to win many otherwise hopeless battles. The Hussars became the envy of Europe, the most powerful and disciplined heavy cavalry the Middle Ages had ever known, and are still a matter of intense national symbolism of Poland. The 16th century was a really big one, and included the Protestant Reformation, affecting mostly German parts of the kingdom, wars against the encroaching Ottomans invading Europe, advancing in science and literature with Copernicus, devising the heliocentric model of the solar system, the nationwide codification. Copernicus, yay! Our university has a link with that name. If you would like to know which Polish university I go to, Go and check out that video if you want to know. If you know, if you want to know what I mean by that. ...of the Polish language, and the biggest one, the changing of the Polish-Lithuanian Union into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Whoa. A single political entity ratified by the Polish Parliament. 1569. Say, with elected rather than hereditary kings. Okay. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or just Poland for short, became a center of power and commerce, and a bulwark against invading Turks would become a larger and larger problem for the European powers mm -hmm. since their humble beginnings in Central Asia. Wow. During the Polish-Muscovite War, the Poles became involved in the Russian succession crisis, or the Time of Troubles, and began flexing their muscles with their famous hussars. They even occupied Moscow for a short period, but were soon driven out because invading Russia is simply impossible unless you are the Mongols. A series of mm. northern wars and the Russo-Polish War left the Commonwealth in a very precarious and weakened state. This was aggravated by the election of Polish kings, which opened the door for other nations to meddle in Polish affairs, which they did a lot. During the wars, the Commonwealth lost the territory of Livonia and was devastated by the so-called Swedish deluge, leaving much of the nation in ruins. Poland became weakened during the Great Northern War against Sweden, and during the War of the Polish Succession, it became increasingly clear that Poland's fate was going to be decided by its neighbours. The Polish Parliament became ineffective due to complicated veto laws which made passing reforms or mounting resistance to invasion nothing if not impossible. The political limbo and the sheer size of the Commonwealth started to make cutting pieces out of it look pretty attractive. The last king of Poland, Stanislaw II, was elected in 1764 as a puppet of the Russian Empire, aided greatly by the fact that he was in bed with Catherine the Great. Stanislav did attempt reform to try and save face, but was aware the kingdom was on its last breath. Before long, the first partition of Poland was enacted, dividing the outlying provinces between Austria, Prussia, and Russia. In dire straits, the parliament was powerless to stop the invading troops and forced to ratify the new borders. The great saint tried once more to reform by drafting a formal constitution. Yeah. Inspired by the liberties of the French Revolution. But it was enough to provoke Russia again, who saw France as an enemy and Poland as a sympathizer to anti monarchical sentiments. Pro and anti constitutional forces became embroiled in a war and Russian forces invaded to broker a defeat to the Republican movement. With an agreement signed with Prussia, the two nations annexed more territory in the Second Partition, reducing Poland to one-third mm -hmm. in size and population. Yes, this I know a little bit about. Yeah, there were three partitions in Poland. Um, I think, as I said, the second one was in 1793. The third one was in 1795, I believe so. That was taken by Prussia, Russia and Austria. And uh, and I was reading a little bit about it. They said that theoretically, obviously depending on who says it, apparently there are like many other um, uh, partitions, like the fourth, fifth, fourth partition being when, well, the start of the Second World War when uh, Russia and 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 uh, Prussia came together. Uh, but obviously those are not the technical terms. But yeah, that's when they got. 1795 that's when they uh, got partitioned and uh, then for 123 years there was like no Poland which is crazy army was in shambles the parliament was divided and powerless the common people were furious and insurrections led to the national rebellion led by the military veteran Tadeusz Kościuszko after an initial success the rebels failed to garner support from many other nations and were defeated by the surrounding powers 
In 1795, the Austrians, Prussians, and Russians decided to put an end to the rebellious Poles mm -hmm. and invaded them from three sides. Wow. The third partition of Poland, as it became known, wiped Poland off the face of the map for the next century. Millions of Poles now found themselves subject to whichever nation they were divided into, isolated huh. from one another, and Poland ceased to exist. Now, as you all know, if you've ever picked up a map, Poland did indeed return as a sovereign nation, but we will have to get to all of that in part two. In the meantime, if you're interested in learning more, why not hit... Okay, wow. I haven't gone that far back into Polish history, so that was really interesting, especially at the beginning with the three brothers, Lech and... Ooh, I don't remember them, but those three brothers, and also at the time when the Catholicism was introduced into Poland, before that you had the pagans and all of that, and of course how the Jews travelled across and so on. But I do remember at one point Poland had the biggest population of the Jews. But yeah, it's so crazy that how the three nations, they just said we've had enough of Poland and hence let's just end them but as you know I never gave up because if they did then well I might not be here people or I might not be in Poland might be in we don't know. So guys, my reaction to part two of the animated Polish history series will be coming very, very shortly. So for that, make sure you stay tuned. And hence, if you've come to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, as always, make sure to drop a like. And if you want to see more, hit that subscribe button and that post notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.